Hey everyone, uh, this is the tutorial for Utor Satsis, uh, who of course is uh, an artist who, who did a lot of architectural works in his time. Uh, the first thing that we want to do is have our final surface in Rhino and go ahead and do a file save as just so we don't overwrite any of the work uh, that we've done so far this semester. So I'm going to name mine Arc Tutorials uh, Satsis, uh, and that's looking great. Uh, the second thing that I want to do is uh, I'm going to go ahead and make a copy of this by simply highlighting everything. Uh, if you have your gumball checked on, which is like this little guy down here, uh, you can type in uh, edit, copy, edit, paste, and then simply hit one of these arrows and move it over by like, I don't know, 20 feet, something like that. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and lock the original uh, uh, couch information that we had going before uh, and that's just so we have like a backup in case we mess this one up we can always come back to the original model that we had the next thing we want to do is uh, zoom into our uh, modeling space by selecting everything and clicking this frying pan looking thing in the standard tab uh, if you don't have uh, any of the things that I click or reference go ahead throughout this video go ahead and type in toolbar uh, so for example, the standard one that I just mentioned, all you'd have to do is check that off right here uh, and hit OK and then it would pop up and you could place it wherever you wanted. So, uh, so once I'm zoomed into this, I'm going to uh, look at all the information that I don't really need. Uh, I think if we look at something by Itor Satsis, uh, clearly he just uses kind of very simple geometries and then a lot of patterns. Uh, the patterns aren't actually something that we're going to do in Rhino. Instead, we are going to do those in Illustrator. Uh, and actually, while I'm on this Google search, I'm going to go ahead and kind of model our, our project off of this image. And I'm going to go ahead and do File, Save Image As, and I'll call it like Satsis 1. Uh, great. So uh, what I can do now is uh, make a new layer by right clicking and hitting new layer. I think on Mac there's a little plus button down at the bottom and I'm going to name it uh, reference image. And uh, making sure that I'm selected on that layer and there's a little checkbox next to it, I'm going to type in picture, uh, the command. And uh, I'm just going to place that uh, Etor Satsis image nearby just so we don't have to kind of switch between uh, Google and this project. We can actually just directly bring the image into Rhino and kind of work from here. We're going to go ahead and lock that as well. So uh, you'll notice that Etor Satsis uses isometric views. Uh, this is actually an axonometric view, but uh, there's a whole kind of... Uh, Rhino doesn't do it very well. It actually manipulates the model in order to do that, and we don't want to do that at all. So we're just going to do the isometric view uh, by going to our drop down by this perspective tab hitting set view uh, and then isometric and then you can pick one of these. Uh, I know for my model to the northwest view is the best one simply because it starts to so show some of this shadow in the in the rendered view uh, and you get the most information. Something like this isn't good because this backside is blocking out a lot of this information. Something like this is fine. This is obviously the ideal one and then this one also hides a lot of information. So uh, like I said, we're going to go ahead and uh, get into our isometric view and we're also going to hide all the information that we don't need. So if we look at, at what uh, Satsis is doing, he basically uses textures and kind of underlying patterns, uh, which we're going to do as well. And uh, you can imagine this just as easily being uh, this chair surface that we have going on right here. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, basically hide everything except for the surface. I really don't think I need the intersection lines and I really don't think I need the grid lines. Uh, I might keep the grid just because maybe we can do something on the ground, uh, but uh, other than that I just need the surfaces. So I'm going to click on surfaces and then uh, control click on grid. And when I right click on one of those and select those objects, you'll notice that it selects everything on both of those layers. At which point I can go to this uh, burnt out light bulb up here and click the fourth one in, uh, isolate objects to hide everything except for the surfaces and the grid on the bottom. So now what I want to do is, is basically make an environment that's similar to what Satsis has going on. Uh, his drawings are very simple, but they're very elegant. Uh, and so in Rhino, we're actually not going to need to do uh, a ton of, of work. We're going to do something similar where we have uh, a kind of lifted up couch and then a, a more vertical version of the couch. And the way we're going to do that uh, is by selecting our entire couch. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and hide the grid for right now. 
Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, copy this over by typing copy and then simply bringing a copy over here. Uh, if you hold down shift, it'll lock it in 90 degree increments around uh, the object. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Uh, if you weren't able to select something uh, like I was able to, see how like that end and INT pop up? Uh, you wanna turn on your O snaps and make sure that all of these ones that I have checked are checked. So uh, if I turn off O snap, obviously, I'm not able to select that corner point, whereas if it's turned on, I am. So uh, make sure that end, near, point, mid, intersection, perpendicular, quad, and knot are all uh, checked off. So uh, what we're gonna do is uh, we're going to, I'm gonna turn back my grid on real quick. And you'll notice that uh, in his reference image, he has a couple of columns. So I'm gonna go ahead and make a new layer called columns and uh, switch to that layer. I'm gonna go ahead and make it green too so I can see what I'm working with. And uh, I'm going to actually uh, just make a couple of columns on this grid. Uh, and the way that I'm gonna do that is by clicking on this rectangle tool or uh, typing in rectangle. Uh, and uh, let's say that we wanna set it in two on our grid and make it two wide, something like that. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and type in copy and, and bring that over to uh, the similar space over here. So now we have two uh, columns, quote unquote, on the underside. And uh, I think we can probably place a couple of more on there. Maybe let's just do one more kind of in, in the middle. Uh, so if you click on something and there's multiple things that you could be targeting, the selection menu is gonna pop up. I'm gonna go ahead and hit this curve. Uh, I know that because it's green, it's on it's on the proper layer. And that's a, it's uh, why it's important to keep organized uh, in your Rhino file. So if I click on the midpoint here and bring it over to the center of this, uh, I think that looks pretty good. We'll have a, a three part column grid. I'll go ahead and type copy and bring it down to the uh, center of the uh, surface. And then I'll go ahead and do one more down here. And now I can just right click on my columns layer and select all of those objects. And you notice that all nine of those are now uh, uh, selected. So if I go back into my Northwest view, uh, yours might be different. I'm gonna go ahead and type in extrude CRV, and that's going to extrude the curves that we have selected uh, up or down, depending on what we wanna do. I'm gonna go ahead and hit uh, solid equals yes. Uh, and uh, let's see, if I bring this down, let's say negative six, that's not enough. So I'm gonna try this again. Uh, if I type in six, it's still not enough. Basically, I wanna make sure that I'm locking myself into my isometric view because this is the final one that we're actually gonna be looking at. So if I type in extrude curve again, I'm gonna go ahead and type in, let's say uh, 12. That's a little bit better. Uh, I think it's about the right size. Uh, now, while I still have these selected, I can actually type in negative uh, 12 and it'll bring it down to the base of these. Uh, if it doesn't, if for some reason it gets misaligned like this, you can simply type in move and then click on the corner of this and the corner of this. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and isolate these ones as well. So you notice that his columns have a little bit of a bump out from them and we're gonna do something similar by selecting each one individually and typing in offset. And now what I can do, uh, let's just go ahead and offset it by one or a small unit and uh, basically offset it so we can have another set of objects to extrude. So uh, while we do the uh, offset, we're gonna have to select this and then right click to uh, re-enter the command. Uh, that just basically repeats the same thing that you just did. And then once you offset it, I'm gonna go ahead and delete the initial one that we had. I'm gonna go ahead and do the same for these. Uh, so again, I'm just right clicking to uh, repeat that same offset command and deleting stuff as I go. And this is looking pretty good. Uh, so now when I type in show, all of that other stuff is going to uh, pop back up. And you'll notice that some of this original information that we had came back up too. I'm just gonna go ahead and hide the entire layer because uh, I don't think we really need it. Uh, at this point in the tutorial. So uh, making sure that I'm still in my columns layer, I'm gonna type in extrude and then negative one. And uh, that gives us a nice little feet for the columns. Uh, so there's two options from this point. You can either, uh, you'll notice that these are separate objects. So you can either group them, uh, which I would uh, not recommend simply because it's easy to lose track of what all you've grouped. Uh, instead, I'm gonna go ahead and select everything here and type in Boolean union. 
Basically what that's doing is detecting that these are two solid objects, which is why we changed that uh, 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 setting up here. And now, as you can see, they're one combined poly surface. So I think we have the left, left one pretty well taken care of. Uh, if we want, we can make some kind of awning like they have going right here. Uh, and so I'm gonna make a new layer called uh, overhang and we'll go ahead and make that red or any color, it doesn't really matter. And I'm gonna switch to that layer. And if I type in rectangle again, uh, I can click on one corner of this couch surface and then the uh, opposite corner of the couch surface, which will create a line uh, that's right here uh, along the bottom. If yours for some reason isn't like snapping to these objects specifically, make sure that project is turned off. Basically what project does is it uh, locks it down to this grid. So if you're trying to draw something above the grid, it's automatically gonna snap back down uh, to this one over here, which is not ideal for this particular situation, uh, but it's certainly helpful in others. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and now that I have my rectangle selected, I'm gonna go ahead and offset it. Uh, let's offset it by like two, something a little bit bigger. Uh, and then we will uh, extrude this one by two. Uh, we actually want it to go upwards, so we're gonna have to type a negative two, maybe. It's being kind of weird on me right now. Uh, but as you can see, we now have an overhang. So I'm gonna go ahead and combine uh, this with all of these pieces. You'll notice that all of mine are still split into individual pieces. The way, the way I'm gonna fix that is by right-clicking on my surfaces tab and uh, hitting select all so that all of them get joined. I'm gonna deselect this one by holding down control and then clicking dragging, and then I'm gonna type in join. Uh, and as you can see, that's now one solid object. Uh, and because it's solid and because this is solid, I can now type in Boolean union and uh, you can see that it becomes a single object. So I think our left side of the tower is looking pretty good. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and make the right side of the tower now. Uh, I think that uh, we should actually probably rotate this 90 degrees by having our gumball turned on and uh, selecting all the columns as well. Basically, uh, in the gumball, we can either type in, because it's going counterclockwise, we'd have to type in negative 90. Uh, alternatively, we can just click this arc, hold down shift, and it'll snap to a 90 degree angle, like so. Uh, so now I'm gonna bring this one uh, over to the right. Uh, and the way I'm gonna do that is by going into my top view, having that object selected and typing in move. Uh, now, because we wanna keep it uh, on the same plane. Actually, we probably don't. I'm gonna go back into my parallel view, sorry about that. And uh, basically, I'm gonna click on this corner down here, and I am going to uh, click on uh, the, the lowest point of, of this column, which is gonna be right here, and you'll see that these are overlapping. Now, I wanna go into my top view and turn on project. Because we know that it's on the proper uh, kind of uh, elevation, we need to just basically move it into place. So if I type in move and kind of bring it over to where this corner is, uh, it should, when we go back into our parallel view, be perfectly aligned and it's perfectly aligned here. So we're gonna turn off uh, project now. And uh, it's kind of a, a weird size. You notice that this tower is actually a little bit taller. What I'm gonna do is, uh, while I still have this whole thing selected, uh, I'm gonna bring it, I'm gonna bring this whole thing over here a little bit just so we don't compete with the picture. Uh, if I uh, join these ones as well, no, I'm not gonna do that. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and type in scale 1D. And what scale 1D is gonna do is instead of scaling the entire thing proportionally, it's gonna only scale it in one direction. So if I click on this bottom corner here, and uh, the topmost point here, you're gonna notice that it stretches it in one direction. Uh, depending on how complex your surface is, the Make 2D might not work very well for it. So I'm only gonna double the size uh, of this thing. And the way I can do that, a really easy way is to say, uh, I'm gonna get the end here and the midpoint here and up here. So the midpoint obviously is the halfway point uh, between two points. So by going here, we're halfway there and then we scale it up to the full point to double its size. Uh, I also probably wanna make sure that this is a little bit above this. So if I go into a, uh, maybe a right view, for example, let's see if it's the right one. 
Uh, okay, that'll work. We can see that the bottommost point of our uh, uh, curved surface is right here. I'm gonna turn on project again and move it upwards uh, at this very corner and just basically make sure that it is at this point or even a little bit higher. I'm gonna go ahead and move mine up, let's say two uh, units or uh, four units, something like that. So now when I go back into my parallel view, we're gonna notice that this is a much taller tower. Uh, my pieces are still individual and that's a good thing. Uh, basically, I'm gonna delete my bottom face right here and I'm going to uh, activate my surfaces layer and type in rectangle yet again. And uh, I'm going to basically click on op. Oop, I need to turn off project. I need to click on opposite corners like so. Select that curve and uh, extrude it downward uh, to right here. But we also want to make sure that it's no longer solid because all of these are uh, empty planes, of course, up here. So I'm going to turn off solid uh, and uh, go ahead and click on this bottom most point. So now what I can do is uh, select all of these surfaces, all of the blue ones. Alternatively, you can hit surfaces, select objects, uh, and join them. So now when I click on it, it's obviously one piece. So uh, we're getting pretty close in Rhino. I think one more thing we can do is kind of do this uh, perimeter wall that they have going on. The way we're gonna do that is by uh, creating a new layer called uh, uh, wall excuse me, and uh, turning it to cyan maybe and activating that layer. And uh, what we can do now is go into our top view and uh, type in rectangle and uh, basically make one that covers the entire boundaries of all this stuff. Now that I'm looking at this in, in plan view, I probably wanna skew this a little bit too. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and type in scale, not scale 1D. And if I click on a point uh, like so, and uh, it's gonna ask me for a scale factor, let's say I just wanna make it 25% bigger, uh, I would type in 1.25 because it would become uh, 1.25 its uh, normal size, and hit enter. And if I go back into my parallel view that may have messed with the bottom of it, it did. So I'm gonna go back into my right view and basically type in move, turn on my project, and make sure that this is realigned. So we should be pretty good now. Uh, might be a little bit too big, uh, but you can kind of play around with the size of this stuff. I'm gonna use scale 1D again and just kind of uh, bring it back down to a more reasonable, more reasonable size. So I'm gonna click here, here, and then maybe click on, on this point. And I think that looks a little bit better. I'm gonna go ahead and save, file save. You should do the same. And uh, now we can make that perimeter wall. So if I go to top and turn on project with my wall layer still made, I can type in rectangle and uh, basically click on the bottom left point of the selection and the top right point of the selection. And let's go ahead and offset this by, uh, uh, actually let's look at the, the, the reference image first. So it actually gives more space to the front of it and it doesn't really give any space to it in the back. Uh, so let's say that we wanna give the back uh, uh, a foot buffer or a two unit buffer. I'm gonna type in two and do something like that. Uh, and then while I still have this interior one selected, maybe I wanna offset the front by 12. So something like that. Now what I can do is uh, delete this initial one like so, and uh, basically select both of these rectangles that we just made and uh, click on here. And if you hover over this bottom point, uh, it's gonna turn white. And basically any point that you drag along that line, it's gonna lock to it. So we know that this is a 12 foot offset. And so we're just gonna go ahead and click on that point and delete the other two uh, offsets. Uh, I'm gonna make mine a little bit bigger uh, just because uh, it's a little bit narrow now that I'm looking at it. You can uh, make that as skinny or as uh, uh, wide as you would like but I think I want mine to look a little bit more like this. So now when I go to my parallel view, we'll see that uh, yet again, things have been misaligned. So if I go back into my right view with this box selected, I can type in move, make sure that project is on and basically just move it down to the bottom most point and we should be good to go. Uh, so at this point, we need to know how tall we need to make our wall. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to set view isometric northwest and uh, if I type in extrude curve yet again, 
Uh, I'm going to go ahead and type in, I want it to be something like this. You can either just kind of click and drag and, and find something that you like, or you can make it a more calculated thing. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and make mine maybe 12. I'm going to go ahead and make mine 24. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Um, so there's a lot of kind of courtyard space here that I actually want to uh, put into, into my drawing as well. So if I type in a uh, uh, line and with project still activated, I want to give it another 12 units. Again, this is, this is up to you how much, how you want it to look. If I hold down shift, it'll lock it to a 90 degree angle. And what I can do from here is basically select that uh, extrusion that we just made, go scale 1D and make sure, oops, and make sure that uh, we're getting it out a little bit further like so. Sweet, I think that's looking a lot better. So uh, at this point, we wanna make sure that this wall has a little bit of thickness and we can do that by typing in offset SRF, uh, making sure that the arrows are pointed to the outside. I'm gonna go ahead and make it two units thick, hit enter twice and that'll give us that thickness. Uh, instead of doing kind of like a, a tacked on thing, well actually, actually since it's kind of the focal point of the drawing, we should probably just do that. Uh, you'll notice that that offset surface actually filled at the edges, which is not what we want. So I'm going to hit control Z or edit undo, type in offset SRF. And uh, we're going to make sure that the corner profile is sharp. Uh, and we're just going to hit two, enter, enter yet again. So now what we can do is type in, uh, uh, go back to our overhang layer and type in rectangle turn off project, make sure we're selecting this corner and the opposite one. And we're also gonna make one on the interior part of this wall. So once I have these two lines done, I'm gonna go ahead and offset them by selecting it and typing an offset. I'm gonna offset it by one unit and I'm going to offset the other one by a unit. Uh, if I select both of them and type in extrude CRV, I can go ahead and hit solid equals yes by simply clicking on it. And I'm going to uh, type in two uh, to to bring it upwards two units. Again, if, if yours is extruding downward, just go ahead and type in negative two. And uh, I think we are in pretty good shape. The last kind of major thing we should probably do is uh, create this kind of perforation in the front facade. So let's make a new layer and call it a uh, tunnel because that's pretty much what it is. And I'm gonna change the color to, I'm running out of them, dark green, I suppose, and activate that layer. Now what I can do is a command called box. Uh, and basically if I click on a point and say, I want it to be, uh, I don't know, uh, 64 units uh, by, actually I need, to, need it to be a little bit bigger. Let's make it 128 units by uh, 32 units. That might be a little bit big. So I'm gonna hit escape to get out of that. Let's do 128 by uh, 16, and then we'll make it uh, 32 units tall. It might be a little bit big because of this wall, so I'm gonna go ahead and type in scale 1D and scale that down halfway. Basically what I wanna do is move it so that uh, the midpoint ends up on the midpoint of this. And uh, now I can kind of see that it's actually a little bit too long as well. So again, using scale 1D, I'm gonna bring it back down maybe to the midpoint like so. Basically, as, as long as this surface and this surface are intersecting, which we can see they are because of this kind of perforation like this, uh, I can go ahead and click this and type in Boolean split. Uh, so instead of Boolean union where it joins solid objects, this one will subtract solid objects. Uh, so I can just go ahead and uh, with that one selected, run the command, then click my green one, right click, and you'll notice that if I control click on uh, this part of the surface, not where it's intersecting, over here, uh, it actually cuts out uh, that portion of the wall. And uh, he leaves a little bit of a gap on his, and I suppose that we can do the same. I'm gonna go ahead and do scale 1D, make it half as tall, and then scale 1D again, make it like 0.75. Whoops, we'll make it, uh, let's say 12 units instead of 16. So I think uh, this is pretty much all that we need to do for the modeling portion. I guess the last thing that we need to do is type in, uh, uh, make a new layer called floor, activate it, type in rectangle, uh, go into our top view, make sure that project is turned on, and we are going to 
uh, basically hover over that corner and that corner to create this intersection like so. Drag it to the opposite corner. We'll offset it once more by like maybe two units uh, and hit delete on that one. And uh, of course we need to bring it back down. So let's go ahead and go to our right view, type in move, make sure project is on and move it to the bottom most point like so. And uh, he keeps his as a, as a partially offset surface. So we're gonna do the same. Uh, if I type in planar SRF with these four lines selected, basically it's gonna make a plane out of those, at which point we can just type in offset SRF, click it to make sure the arrows are facing down and we'll make it one unit thick. Uh, and now I think we are in really good shape uh, to mimic something like this. So uh, if I go to my Northwest view or whatever isometric view you've been using, uh, you want to make sure that you uh, uh, basically make sure that we only have this in our uh, viewport. So I'm going to go ahead and unlock all of the things uh, that we have over here. And I'm going to go ahead and hide those. And uh, that'll leave us room to basically select this and click on our frying pan to zoom to our selection. Uh, double check that we're in our isometric view, which we are. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and save. So uh, at this point, Itor Satsas, he doesn't really use the skylight command. Uh, we might have to simply because uh, we want to see more of this depth, but we're going to turn it very low and we're going to rely mostly on uh, the shading of the sun. So uh, if we uh, actually look at this thing one more time, we need to make, an, we need to make sure that the ground plane is, is active uh, when we go to our render settings, right? Uh, because uh, basically the... If we did it right now and we didn't have this kind of background, the shadow would stop right here. And of course it continues off the page in this example. So uh, making sure that we are once again in our Northwest view or whatever view, uh, we're gonna go ahead and switch to a rendered viewport. Uh, so our ground plane is on um, and there's actually a horizon line. So if you right click on your render settings, uh, I don't know if there's a way to adjust that. I might find it out really quick. Let's see. Uh, so we're actually not going to be able to really adjust the ground plane too much. Uh, so what we're going to do is go back to a shaded view uh, and we're going to name a new layer called floor two. And uh, I actually will just call it ground because ground is different than floor. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, activate that layer and basically make a rectangle from turn off project from this corner and then we'll make a really big one and run that planar SRF command again. And that'll make a plane. So now when we uh, zoom in to just these objects by going to our set view isometric northwest and then clicking on our uh, frying pan with eggs, uh, basically I can select this, double click on my viewport and uh, center it in my, in my top view, something like this. So now uh, when we render it, when we go to our rendered view, we'll notice that the shadows, uh, once we turn the sun on, are going to actually peak off and there's no horizon line left. So uh, again, if I type in S-U-N, sun, uh, I can turn the sun on and off. We wanna have it on. And uh, you can make the location wherever you'd like. I'm gonna go ahead and make mine Omaha NB. Uh, and basically I just wanna make sure that the shadow is kind of going off this way like he tore Satsas was. was. Uh, and the way I'm going to do that is by adjusting these sliders right here. Uh, I think something like this starts to look pretty good. Uh, and uh, now we can exit out of this and right click on our render settings again. And uh, you'll notice that you can't really see the shadows very well. I'm going to go ahead and turn the skylight intensity down to like 0.25. And now we start to see a lot harder, sh uh, harsher shadows. If we turn off the skylight, we can see that it's just like strictly black and white which could be nice, but I don't, I don't really think I want to do it for this drawing. Uh, I do want to have a, a little bit more kind of definition to this, which I get from uh, uh, turning on the skylight. Uh, if you want to, you can leave it off. I don't really see a huge problem with this other than this kind of thing right here, but we're going to have to adjust that in Photoshop anyways. Uh, so I'm going to leave it up to you. If you want to have the skylight on, you can just turn the intensity down. Uh, I'm actually going to turn it off. Um, at this point, we can go back up to our resolution and quality. You can leave yours as viewport and uh, 72. I'm gonna go ahead and beef mine up simply because I have like a 
kind of video thumbnail to make on uh, on YouTube. So I'm gonna turn up the DPI to something a little bit better, like 150, uh, and then make it good quality. Uh, but basically, if I uh, make sure that transparent background is checked, uh, I can hold shift and right click to pan over a little bit just to make sure I get this whole shadow in view. Uh, and I think from here, I should just be able to render. And uh, we're gonna make an image that we're able to bring into Illustrator. So if you have the skylight turned on, it's gonna take a little bit to process. If you have it off, uh, you can simply uh, uh, just kind of keep rolling forward. So I'm gonna go save image as. I'm going to make sure that this says PNG. Uh, I'm going to save it as uh, render, Satsis render underlay. I don't know if I'm spelling his name right, so sorry if I look stupid in this tutorial. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and exit out of this. And now making sure that I'm in the same view, do not move this view after you have rendered it. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, lock that ground plane that I accidentally clicked and dragged. If I select everything uh, and uh, go back to my Northwest view, basically you just need to always make sure you're at the same angle. I'm gonna go ahead and hit make 2D so we can get that line work. You can choose to group the output and make the scene silhouette if you'd like. Etor Satsis doesn't really use it, so I'm not going to either. And when I hit okay, I should be able to go into my top view and everything looks pretty freaking good to me. Uh, so at this point, we are going to uh, bring it into Illustrator. So if I highlight all of this and bring it closer to the origin point by typing, uh, clicking in, clicking move, clicking on this corner point and typing in zero, uh, that'll bring it to the origin point of the entire document, at which point I can say file export selected uh, we'll call it Satsis uh, line work or LW. Uh, and when we hit save, making sure that this is Adobe Illustrator, not Rhino 6, we're gonna hit save. Uh, it's gonna bring up this menu that allows us to alter the scale. Uh, 10 to one seems to be a pretty safe bet based on what a lot of you uh, have been uploading to Box. I think everyone's pretty much in the same uh, range, but you may need to adjust this and kind of trial and error it uh, to uh, get the right size. So if I go ahead and hit okay, It'll tell us that we uh, successfully saved it to this folder. If I type in file save, which you all should do the same, uh, I can now open up Illustrator and check out that line work. All right, so once I have Illustrator open, I can go ahead and go up here and go to file open, uh, and we'll open up that uh, line work file that we just made. And uh, basically we want the artboards to be like less than 24 by 24, basically. So if we go to document setup right here, uh, we're gonna go ahead and hit edit artboards and uh, 24 by eight is okay. Ba uh, a lot of Satsis' stuff is actually a lot more vertical than it is horizontal. Ours is, is kind of boxy, uh, but we'll, it still kind of implies uh, an emphasis on, on verticality because of this tower that we have going on right here. So I'm gonna go ahead and make mine, let's say uh, 12 by 18, something like that. And uh, basically if I go to my selection tool or hit V on my keyboard, it gets us out of that. Uh, next thing I'm gonna do is select all of my line work. And uh, there should be a width and height uh, dimensions that pop up up here. I want to make sure that this uh, constrain width and height proportions button is checked. Uh, if I don't have it checked and I change this to like 12 inches, you'll see that it only shrinks one way and that's not what we want. Uh, we want to scale the entire thing proportionally. So I'm going to go ahead and make sure that is uh, checked off. If our artboard is uh, 12 inches wide, uh, we want to give it at least an inch buffer. So I'm going to go ahead and make the width 10 and that should uh, give us an inch on either side of this. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit uh, edit copy uh, and then actually delete everything. If I hit control zero and do uh, edit paste, what that's gonna do is bring all of that uh, artwork back and center it on the page. If yours pops up and it's only on one layer, Go to this tr uh, triple dot drop down right here and make sure that paste remembers layers is turned on. So for example, if I have it turned off and I do control C, control V, it's gonna put everything on one layer. That is not what we want. So make sure that that uh, paste remembers layers item is checked. Uh, once we have this in place, I'm just gonna select everything by hitting control A and then changing the stroke to like 0.5. Uh, and then if I go down to my stroke right here, I'm gonna make sure it's all black just so I can use it as a reference moving forward. Uh, so that's looking pretty good. 
Uh, if, if anything in my workspace you do not have, uh, go to Window, Workspace, and then I use Essentials Classic. Uh, but for example, if you don't have the Links uh, layer, basically you can go to Window uh, and make sure that Links is checked, and then it'll uh, pop up somewhere and you can kind of drag it over to the side. Uh, so while we're talking about that, let's go ahead and open one that we'll need later, which is the Swatch panel. So if I go to Window, Swatches, uh, I want to make sure that uh, I have that uh, either off to the side or, or as part of its own toolbar over here. Uh, I'm going to leave it isolated uh, and we'll see why in a little bit. Uh, but basically what we can do uh, now, let's go ahead and bring our uh, render underlay into this. So if I create a new layer by hitting this plus icon, I'm going to rename my layer render underlay. Uh, underlay. Underlay, underlay, there we go. Uh, and I'm gonna drag it to the very bottom. Uh, and making sure that I have that selected, I'm gonna go ahead and hit File, pay, uh, Place. And what that'll allow me to do is uh, double click on this file and bring it in. Uh, so Satsis, yes, he does things vertically, but looking at this render, we I actually might wanna just keep it as, as a square. Uh, we'll kind of mess with those proportions a little bit later, but in any case, I'm going to go ahead and while I have this selected, turn it down to like 50%. Uh, and what that'll allow me to do is see what's going on with the line work and also see the edges of my model space. So please take the time to really uh, line this up uh, to to the, the line work. Uh, maybe I need to actually bring it up a little bit darker so I can see the edges a bit better. Basically what I'm doing is looking at the furthest right point on this, uh, which would be this corner in the render underlay, and I line it up. Uh, and then uh, obviously it's too small, so I'm gonna go ahead and shift, click, and drag on this corner to scale it proportionally. Uh, and now it's a little bit misaligned, but basically I just keep going back to the same point, making sure it's in the right spot, and then uh, kind of adjusting the scale of this thing as I go. So that might be pretty close actually. You can zoom in really uh, quickly by hitting Control plus. Uh, you can also zoom out very quickly by hitting Control minus. So that's a really useful tip to know. Uh, and as we see, I'm still a little bit off. I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger, something like so. And I think that might be winner, winner, chicken dinner. Basically, we wanna make sure that all of these edges are uh, being hidden by lines, at least for the most part. Uh, for the, the render underlay, depending on what DPI you used, it's gonna be a little bit worse. Uh, and I'm just gonna kind of keep fine tuning this very briefly. Uh, basically, if it's like a 72 DPI, the edges are gonna be a bit rougher and you're not gonna be able to get it super exact. Uh, so just be mindful of that as you start to align it, but get it as good as you can. Don't just kind of plop the image on and uh, uh, make it look bad. Uh, so I'm pretty, I'm pretty happy with this. I think if I line it up like that, I think I need to make it a little bit less vertically. Sorry for me, seeming like I'm stalling do something like that. I think that's probably about as close as we are going to get. So that's great. Once that's in place, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, lock the layer that the render underlay is on. And uh, from here, we're gonna bring in that same reference drawing. I'm gonna make a new layer, drag it to the bottom, rename it reference layer. And uh, we're gonna go ahead and go back to our file place and place that Satis image that we had before. We're gonna go ahead and double click on that and bring it in. Uh, and what we can do is basically just bring that off to the side, making sure that it's not on this white workspace. Uh, and uh, I think it's gonna be a pretty good reference for us from here on out texturally and, and color wise. Uh, so I'm gonna unlock my render underlay again. You can see that the shadows are pretty harsh in this. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and bump this up to probably like I don't know, 80 or 90. If you don't like the gray in the background, you can go ahead and go to uh, edit this in Photoshop by going over to your links tab. Again, if you don't have links, you can go to window links. Uh, if I click on this location, it'll open it up in my file explorer on my computer, at which point I can just right click and open with Photoshop. And uh, what we're gonna basically do is select all the harsh shadows with the magic wand and then delete everything else. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a pretty effective way to uh, kind of collaborate between these two programs. So if I'm in Photoshop and I go to this magic wand tool right here, I'm gonna go ahead and turn down my tolerance to like four. And basically what that means is if I click on this, uh, it's not gonna pick up some of these grays, 
Whereas if I turn the tolerance up to like 50, basically it's selecting a little bit more because uh, its tolerance is a little bit higher. It's kind of counterintuitive. But the higher that number is, the more colors it's going to pick up. So because we just want to kind of mess with the, uh, the blacks of this image, we're going to go ahead and type in 4. Uh, and then click on any of the black parts. Right click and hit similar. And now what we can do is uh, right click, select inverse, and hit delete. And that's just going to leave us with the shadows uh, that we have. So if we go ahead, don't crop it or anything, just go ahead and do file, save as. Uh, we want to make sure that it's a PNG, which it is. If I replace the image, be careful when you do this, but if you replace the image by overwriting it and hit OK, uh, basically once it's done saving down here, we can go back into Illustrator and it's going to ask us if we want to modify the links. If we hit yes, you'll notice that it's going to uh, bring up those exact shadows, exactly what we had in, in Photoshop. So uh, I'm not too big of a fan of how, how pixelated this looks. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and go back into Photoshop and use what's called the, the blur tool. So if I hit control plus, uh, similar kind of characteristic among the uh, uh, Adobe products, if I go to the smudge tool, and hold down on it and then release on the blur tool. I can hit the small bracket by my backspace on the keyboard and basically get it to about this size and actually blur the edge. Uh, it looks a little bit different than this, so I'm gonna go ahead and change the strength to maybe 50%. And uh, I think that looks a little bit better. This is, again, one of those things that you can kind of fine tune and play with. I think 25% is probably gonna be our best bet. So once we have this pixelation made, uh, we can just hit Control S or File Save. Uh, overwrite that existing image. And when we go back to Illustrator, of course, it's gonna ask us to update it once again. And it looks a little bit better. It's not great, but uh, we, can, we can make it work. So uh, from here, what we wanna do is uh, lock this layer yet again by going to our Layers tab and locking it. And uh, we're gonna start to look at some of these textures. So I'm going to go ahead and hide that render underlay altogether just so we can uh, focus on the line work that we have. Uh, the first thing I would like you to do is to uh, select everything, type in edit, copy, and then edit, paste in place. And it doesn't look like it's done anything, but it's actually pasted all of this line work on top of itself. So if I go to object, transform, move, or shift, control, M, I can type in negative uh, 10 inches here. Actually, let's do negative 20. Uh, and then don't change it at all in the vertical direction and hit zero. Basically, it's going to drag a copy of all of this off to the side. So again, it's this idea of uh, having an additional copy to come back to in case you mess something up. So if I do a uh, file save, uh, basically just as this extension of, of converted, and that's fine. I'm going to go ahead and hit save, hit OK. Uh, now we have uh, a pretty good groundwork that we can start to base stuff on. So if we want to add textures, uh, that's textures in Photoshop or uh, Illustrator rather are called swatches. Uh, and basically what we need to do is make a new layer called swatches. And uh, we can drag that to the to the bottom layer uh, underneath the we want it underneath the render underlay. Uh, and because he has uh, uh, one, two, the, the, they look like two different textures, but they're actually the same. Uh, and then these two walls are the same. We're going to do something very similar. So we have uh, this box, which is going to be its own texture. So that's one. This wall is going to be its own texture. So that's two. This guy is going to be its own texture, which is three. And this one's going to be its own texture, which is four. So we know that we want to have four copies of this. So if I repeat that same process, edit, copy, edit, paste in place, object, transform, move. Uh, I'll do like negative 10 inches or uh, negative 12 inches just to give it a little bit of breathing room. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to do that again to make four copies. You can do control sheet C, control shift V, control shift M, uh, and make sure that you're just moving it down 12 inches. Basically, we want to make it consistent so that we can snap it back into the right spot without having to kind of uh, zoom in super intensely and uh, uh, kind of fidget around in that view. This way, it's a calculated thing that we can quickly snap back to. So. Uh, uh, this is going to be one set of objects. Uh, this is, this is, and this is as well. So uh, you'll notice that he actually applies textures one way and one way to another, which means that we're going to have to play with uh, fills twice. 
So actually, instead of four, even though we have four objects, we're going to need four uh, or two for each one. So we actually need a total of eight. So again, edit copy, edit paste in place, edit move, and then I'll subtract like 24 inches. Uh, if you get if you get this uh, object uh, pop up, it means that basically it's not able to move it because uh, it would fall off the page if I tried to do that. So uh, I'm gonna go to Control Shift M and I'm just gonna move it down by 24 inches, uh, keeping that increment of 12. So we'll call uh, we'll explore this thoroughly on uh, uh, these two, this idea of textures, and then I'll fast forward through all the other ones that I do uh, and get back to kind of this this accenting with color. So uh, once I have uh, my, my swatches layer created, what I wanna do is lock everything except for that. And I want to go to my rectangle tool right here. And uh, we're gonna start out with this tower. So I'm gonna do this face and this face. Uh, basically, I'm gonna go down to this uh, bottom corner right here. And you can kind of ballpark this. And basically just make sure that it is uh, the same size as uh, the entire face. So the upper leftmost point and the uh, lower rightmost point. Uh, and I'm gonna do the same thing for the other face on this one. Something like that, and then something like that. Uh, if it's not quite how you like it, you can uh, use these tools to kind of drag it down like so. Uh, and then I also like to make mine a little bit bigger than the extents, but not too much simply because uh, otherwise it looks inconsistent across the entire drawing. So I'm gonna do the same thing right here and the same thing right here. So now I'm gonna go ahead and hide my swatches layer uh, and unlock everything else. Basically, we uh, want to get rid of all of the line work that uh, doesn't pertain to this face. So obviously all of this stuff uh, doesn't affect this face. We just wanna keep this line, this line, this one, this one, uh, kind of this wraparound condition like so, uh, and we wanna get rid of this. So I'm gonna isolate those lines really quickly. Uh, and again, this goes back to all of the conventions that we, we have discussed so far uh, throughout the semester. I'm gonna get rid of this, I'm gonna get rid of this, I'm gonna get rid of this. Uh, if there's a situation where I wanna get rid of this, uh, but it selects the whole line, just go ahead and, and leave it as is. I think a similar thing happened down here so if I just hit Control Z a couple of times, I can go ahead and undo that. Something like, oh, I'm gonna keep that one. Get rid of these. Uh, we know that this is a profile line, so we wanna get rid of this one and this one uh, and all of this stuff kind of down here. This part's gonna take a while, especially because you have to do it for kind of each side individually. Uh, but basically, once I get it to uh, a point like this where only the necessary lines remain, I can go ahead and uh, delete everything else. And what we're going to do now is uh, something called join. So basically, all of these are different lines in Illustrator. So if I select all of them, I can hit Control J or Object uh, Path Join. Uh, and it'll make it uh, as, as connected as it possibly can. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and do the same thing very quickly over here, only keeping the necessary lines. I may or may not fast forward through this depending on how long it takes. I don't think it's gonna take me very long at all. Uh, so these are my essential lines. I hit Control J or Object Join and then delete everything else. So once we have uh, these two shapes like so, we're gonna go ahead and turn on our swatches layer again and hide everything or lock everything except for that swatches layer and make sure that we are selected on it. Uh, if you try to do something on a locked layer, uh, there's gonna be a little uh, uh, circle with an, uh, a line going through it that says you can't do it on that layer. So I'm gonna go ahead and select swatches. Now what I can do is uh, select one of these rectangles. And uh, if I have my swatches panel open, again, if you need it, go to window swatches. I'm gonna hit this little uh, library book icon down here that says Swatch Libraries and uh, hit Patterns, Basic Graphics, Basic Graphics Textures. And what that'll do is bring up a, uh, a series of really basic textures that Illustrator has embedded. You can download them for free online uh, if you really want to. I've downloaded quite a few in the past. Uh, and uh, if you need to see them a little bit bigger, just make sure you hit this triple uh, line thing and hit large thumbnail view. Basically what happens if, if I double click on uh, one of these or even single click it, 
Uh, sometimes it doesn't look like anything has happened, but that's because you may have assigned it to the stroke layer. If I hit the uh, swap fill and stroke button, we'll see that that texture uh, comes in. So uh, Itor Satsis uses, uh, he actually like skews these textures, which is what we're going to need to do. So if I have something like this, we'll go ahead and make uh, something a little bit more uh, aggressive for the main tower, maybe meso tint. Oh, excuse me. I want to make sure that I click on the fill and then do uh, my meso tint. I think that's looking pretty good. Uh, so if I have that selected and hit object rasterize, I'm going to go ahead and hit OK. You want it to be 300 DPI and it shouldn't mess up your computer too badly. Uh, I want to make sure that it's also transparent and hit OK. Basically, what I can do from here is type in or hit object. Uh, envelope distort make with mesh uh, and I just want to hit three and three for this and what that's going to do for us is I don't know why it changed the texture like that it's kind of weird uh, I think it should be fine uh, if I go to uh, this puppet warp tool it's gonna say it doesn't support mesh object type that's fine we just want to make sure that we have the free transform tool that we're able to select. And uh, this small menu should pop up. We wanna click the bottom one called Free Distort. Basically, if I have uh, this on the, the bottom right corner, I can drag this corner up and make sure that it's perfectly in line right here and then do something very similar uh, up here like so. Basically, just make it so it looks pretty, uh, pretty accurate. And uh, then we're just going to basically nudge it down a little bit so that it's a little bit bigger than our extents. And what we should be able to do at this point is unlock uh, our line work that we had going on right here. And uh, if we select both of those and hit Control-7 or Object uh, Clipping Mask Make, you'll notice that it, uh, the texture that we just made conforms perfectly to that set of lines that we just did. Uh, and of course, I can do the same thing over here, making sure that I have the same uh, texture selected, like so. I'm going to go ahead and rasterize it, hit OK. Object, envelope distort, make with mesh, 3 and 3, that looks great. Go to our free transform tool, free distort, and start to play around with those settings to get it perfectly aligned. We'll ballpark the top one. And from here, we should be able to simply hit Control-7, and it'll give us that same uh, same result. So uh, I'm going to fast forward through this part, but effectively, we are going to... We just made the texture for this and this. Now we're going to do it for this and this, the wall, and then this box down here. So it's going to be the same process. I'm just going to fast forward through it uh, because uh, you should be able to just rewind and, and, and use those same steps. So one thing I should mention, uh, if you're not getting the results you quite want, uh, go up to the scissors tool or hit C on your keyboard. It might be under the eraser tool by default. Basically, if you click at a point along a line, uh, it'll allow you to simply delete that part of the line. So this would have filled in, uh, this filled in with my original hatch. And uh, now that I got rid of that, obviously this is an open area, so there's no boundary for it to uh, kind of conform to. So now that we have all of these pieces taken care of, I'm going to go ahead and uh, move them up by typing in Control shift m or alternatively Object Transform Move. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and do that for all of them to get them back into their proper places. And uh, I think this should be good to go. We'll see that we have all the textures in the right places. And once we uh, move these over by 12 inches and move these over. I think we did 20 inches for this one. Yes, we did. Uh, we'll notice that all of those textures are perfectly aligned to the line work. Uh, you can, uh, if, you, if you need these things to be a little bit darker, what you can do is uh, hide all of the layers except for that one. Uh, swatches, where are you at? Uh, we want to make sure that our uh, all of our swatches are on the swatches layer. We're going to do that by simply clicking on all of the instances that we just made and dragging them down to swatches like so 
if I had all of my layers except for that one and my reference layer probably, what I can do is go to File, Export, Export As, uh, and let's say uh, Satsis uh, Texture. And uh, we can go ahead and open that up in Photoshop. And if we hit Control U or uh, Image Adjustments, Hue and Saturation, we can start to play with the lightness of this thing. So you'll notice that uh, it starts to get a little bit darker when we do that. So that was before, and this is after. You can run that command several times to get it as dark as you'd like them to be. Uh, but I think I'm, I'm pretty content with, with how this looks. So I go to File, Save As, Satsis Texture, uh, PNG. I can hit OK. Uh, and what that'll allow me to do is make a new object or new layer in Illustrator and named it Swatches PNG. Uh, and I am going to go ahead and hide all of the swatches that we just did after I know what their width is. So if I hit Control A or select everything, uh, the width is gonna be 8.7798 inches, so 8.8 .8 inches. I'm gonna go ahead and copy that value and uh, I am going to hide that layer, making sure that I'm on my swatches two layer. I'm gonna go to File Place and place that PNG that we just did. It should be the same size. Uh, we see that it's pretty close, but basically I'm gonna paste that value that we just had to get it the exact dimensions. And if we uh, show all of the layers above it, except for maybe the render underlay, uh, I can simply drag this into the proper place. Uh, and you can see that uh, compared to this, it's a lot darker and more pronounced and we get a lot nicer textures going in this document. So I'm gonna go ahead and control S or file save. And uh, at this point, uh, we need to basically uh, start to look at a little bit more closely about what Torsatsis is doing. He has a, a background color and uh, he has this kind of accent color. And the way that we're gonna get that onto our drawing uh, is by turning off our, our swatches PNG and also turning off our uh, make 2D, or sorry, our, our render layer. Where's that at? I thought I just clicked that, but maybe not. Uh, and what we can do is uh, hit edit, copy, and edit, paste in place. And now uh, we can do object, live paint, make. And what that's gonna do is basically give us a, uh, uh, an object that we can start to individualize how, how it fills in. So for example, uh, if I go to the Shape Builder tool in the Live Paint bucket, uh, and I hover over an area, you're gonna notice that it's gonna let me uh, color it in that red outlined area, whatever I want it to be. So uh, for example, I can very easily go to the eyedropper tool or hit cleverly hitting I on the keyboard and just click on uh, this down here. And if I go back to my paint bucket and simply click on this, you're gonna notice that it fills in with that color. So I'm gonna make it a little bit uh, darker, or actually I can, I can zoom in and see that it's a little bit lighter. So I'll go ahead and double click on my fill and just make it a little bit lighter like so. Go back to my paint bucket and fill it in. Uh, I can also use the eyedropper on the uh, orange part that we just looked at. So we'll fill it in like that making sure that it goes all the way around. Uh, you'll notice that one side is uh, a little bit darker than the other. So we're going to snag that one, fill that in, and we're going to snag this one and fill it in over here. Uh, I'm gonna repeat that process for all of these volumes. So again, I'm going to uh, fast forward for a little bit. All right, so once we have all of that filled in, we're gonna go ahead and turn on our render underlay layer uh, and just see what it looks like. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and make mine, uh, let's say 50%, just so it's not quite as harsh. Uh, and what I can do is uh, basically select that live paint layer. You'll notice that it went to this one. And uh, I can actually uh, turn off the line work on it. So if I hit, click on the stroke and hit none, you're going to notice that uh, it becomes a lot softer. And actually, I think it looks probably a little bit better than what's going on here. Uh, but if I go ahead and drag that down to the uh, bottom, I can turn on my swatches, PNG, and all of the layers above it. And we can start to see that the line work uh, makes a little bit more sense like a Torsatsis is doing. 
So uh, from here, I think the only thing that's really missing is, is this background color. So I'm gonna go ahead and make a new layer, drag it to the very bottom and call it base color. Uh, and if I'm selected on that layer, I can go ahead and go to our trusty rectangle tool. And uh, I'm gonna make it pretty big. I'm gonna make sure that it covers this uh, uh, shadow over here because I might play around with uh, the uh, length and width of the artboard. So if I go ahead and match that color, uh, I can kind of pick whatever I want to pick. So I'm going to go something a little bit more blue, maybe something a little bit more like this. I think that's looking pretty good. You'll notice that uh, this actually didn't get filled in. So if we unlock our layer that that was on, which was uh, this Make 2D, actually what I'm going to do real quick is bring just the Make 2D to its own layer, and we'll call it Fills. Uh, and then that way, uh, we can drag this one back up towards the top uh, and just kind of play around with the layers until you get something that uh, you are happy with. And you're going to see that it like slightly changes every time. Basically, you want to make sure that all the line work is at the top. Uh, the render, the shadow underlay comes next. The swatches are below that and the base is at the very bottom. Uh, and you'll notice that when we have that base, this actually isn't filled in. So uh, if I go to my uh, Make 2D layer that we just did, which is this fills, we can basically go back to our uh, Life Paint Bucket tool and uh, make sure that it's 255 all the way. And if you just spam click that, uh, it's going to take every instance or it should take every instance of that uh, and uh, make it a different color. I think it just kind of looks weird now because uh, this is actually shadowed. But if I uh, click on something, uh, it'll change all instances of that color to that thing. So if I do it here, we're going to see that it just looks weird because of the shadow. So once this is white, uh, I think we're, we're, we're cooking with peanut oil, as they say, on Down Home with the Neelys of the Hit Food Network show. Uh, and from here, we can basically just lock all of the layers and start to play with the proportions of uh, the artboard. So maybe instead of going vertical, we can make it horizontal by changing it from 12 and 18 to 18 and 12. And uh, making sure that all of this stuff is locked, we can just kind of drag it over as such. Uh, it'll tell us that locked objects will not be moved, and we'll say OK. Uh, and from here, I, I think we're, we're, we're in pretty great shape. Uh, so again, you can play around with kind of aligning the shadows and playing with the edges and all of that jazz. Uh, but the last step is to simply do a file save as. Make sure it's a PDF, because we have PNGs, and those will not follow through to your submission on Box. And we'll go Satsis, uh final drawing. And that should wrap up the Ator Satsis, uh, uh tutorial. If uh, you have any questions, of course, reach out to Garrett and I to uh, ask those. And we'll be more than willing to help you. If you need a Zoom meeting or just a quick email explanation, we can do that. Uh, until next time.